thank you for being here today. We're excited that you get to spend some time in a sample class with a Syracuse professor. Um, again, my name is Rachel Skipper. Many of you have already met me on Zoom. I'm our Associate Director of Undergraduate and Graduate Recruitment. I am not going to be joining the remainder of the call. I'm just here to make sure you all get settled and started. Um, if you have questions after the call, you are, of course, welcome to email me. You've got many emails from me at this point, and you can respond. Other than that, I will introduce and leave it to uh, Professor Schmeller, who will be talking to you for the rest of the time. And thank you, Professor Schmeller, for spending some time with our students this evening. Okay. Um, so, yes, my name is uh, Professor Mark Schmeller. I'm a... Uh, uh, professor here in the Department of History. Um, I usually teach uh, classes on the early Republic in the 19th century, as well as communications history. Uh, but I've recently developed an interest in conspiracy theories and their history. And I'll explain why I've developed that uh, interest in a moment. Um, but uh, the theme today is, yeah, conspiracy theories in United States history. Um, you're certainly familiar uh, with the fact that there are a lot of conspiracy theories out and about right there, uh, but there's a longer history, there's a longer sort of trail uh, to this, and I want to sort of take you through that as briefly as possible as I can today. Uh, this is based off of a class uh, that I offer here at SU, uh, a full semester class on conspiracy theories in U.S. history, so this is kind of an overview or a summation uh, of what I do. But um, now I just want to be able to, ah, there we go, right. So today I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what do we mean when we say conspiracy theory? What do I mean for the rest of this talk when I'm talking about what a conspiracy theory is? And then I want to just hit on a couple of, sort of sorry, computer's a bit sticky for that reason, okay. Ah, there we go. Um, on three particular moments or inflection points in the, in the history of conspiracy theory, one that's really about conspiracy theories at the 18th century in 1776, at the origins of our nation. Secondly, you want to talk about a, a different kind of conspiracy theory that develops in the 19th century. And then finally, talk about more recent conspiracy theories. Now, Initially, conspiracy theories were mostly about politics in a very narrow sense. But in the 19th century, they became about sort of broader arguments over who should be an American, what constitutes America, those sorts of things, and worries that America was being subverted by alien forces. More recently, Conspiracy theories have tended to focus on things like technology, on secret government, things like that. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk a little bit about what I mean by conspiracy theory. When I say conspiracy theory, I don't mean actual conspiracies. I mean a belief in a non-existent conspiracy. So a conspiracy theory is people thinking that something happened that didn't. And there are two common characteristics of a conspiracy theory. One is that it invariably contests or argues against the official version of events, right? So the official version of events, for example, for the assassination of President Kennedy was the Warren Report. A conspiracy theorist, and there are many of them when it comes to the Kennedy assassination, would argue against that, right? So a conspiracy theorist will always tell you that this is what you're told to think, but this is what really happened. If you've ever been in an argument with a conspiracy theorist, um, you will also probably recognize the second quality of conspiracy theory that I'm talking about here, which is that it's self-sealing or it's unfalsifiable. That is, conspiracy theories can't be proven wrong, right? In fact, when you say to a conspiracy theorist, there's no evidence for what you're saying, they will say, well, that's proof of the conspiracy, right? Because it's been covered up. So it's very hard to argue someone who really believes in a conspiracy theory out of that theory. 
So those are two significant qualities of a conspiracy theory. Now, psychologists have dug a bit deeper into this and asked, why are people prone to believe in conspiracy theories? Because many of us do in one sense or another. And they focus on two biases that we have psychologically. One of them is the so-called intentionality bias, which is that for many of us, it's hard to understand the randomness of events, right? That things just happen. Conspiracy theorists tend to believe that things happen for a reason and they happen because somebody planned it. So there are no accidents, there are no unintended consequences in the mental world of a conspiracy theorist. Secondly, there's the so-called proportionality bias. What that means is that we tend to think that big events must have large causes. It's hard to imagine for us that something, an event that was really consequential, like say 9-11, could have been planned by a small group of terrorists. So people are prone to look for larger conspiracies and organizations behind that. So those are two things that are just sort of wired into our brains that make us susceptible to conspiracy theories. Political scientists look at conspiracy theories, as you might imagine, a different way. What they see when they look at conspiracy theories are that they're a form of political propaganda. They are lies often designed to demonize and marginalize outside groups or to attack political opponents. And we're going to see a lot of that here in what I'm about to say. More recently, we come to understand that conspiracy theories have become less theoretical and more just about alleging wrongdoing on the part of other people, and that they rely less on evidence than just sort of repetition or what we might call truthiness, right? That a lot of people are saying this, so it must be true. But let's go back and do a little overview of sort of the early history of conspiracy theories. They've always been with us. Uh, in classical history, there are all kinds of conspiracies, of course, uh, Julius Caesar, the Catiline conspiracy, things like that. But let's start with the law, specifically the English law and the kind of legal structure uh, that America is built upon. And understand, first of all, that conspiracy began as a legal term, right? What conspiracy meant when it was set forth in the Ordinance of Conspirators in 1305 by English Parliament was an agreement between two or more people to commit an illegal act. That's still the meaning of conspiracy today. What a conspiracy is legally, a real conspiracy, is an inchoate or preliminary crime. That is, even if I just agree with someone to commit a crime, that's a crime in itself. Now, the reason why the developing English state is so keen to crack down on this is they're trying to consolidate their authority over their people. Conspiracy comes to mean, in early modern England, any collective action that's not officially authorized by the king. So for example, when workers organize into trade unions or journeymen's associations, they're charged with crimes because that is seen as collective action that's not authorized by the king or the king in parliament. So there's a very broad scope of activities that can count as a conspiracy in English law. And that's gonna influence the way that the English and subsequently the Americans think about conspiracy. 17th century England is full of political plots. The gunpowder plot of 1605, for example, 
uh, in which a anti-Catholic rebel by the name of Guy Fox att attempts to, I'm sorry, a, a, a Catholic rebel by the name of Guy Fox attempts to blow up parliament. He's found sitting allegedly on top of several barrels of gunpowder. England, of course, is a Protestant nation. They are very fearful of Catholic subversion. And this comes out in the Popish plot of 1678. A man by the name of Titus Oates approaches Charles II and his ministers, claims that he's discovered a plot among Catholics to murder Charles II. And it sort of spills out of control from there. More and more people identify other suspects. There's some 541 by the time we're done with it. 20 Jesuit priests are executed and Catholics are driven out of London. This is an example of the kind of panic or moral panic that often attends conspiracy theories. If you look closely at the Declaration of Independence, you'll see a, a conspiracy theory. You'll see language about how the British government has a design to reduce colonists under absolute despotism, or that all of the things that are listed, right, the crimes of George III, have a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny. Because this is the way that people think about politics in the 18th century. Again, it's the intentionality bias. If someone is doing something, there must be a larger purpose to it. And that things that happen don't just happen, they happen for a reason and they happen because someone intended it. A few years later, after the American Revolution comes the French Revolution, which is even more difficult for people to explain given the scale of it. This is the largest nation in Europe. This is the center of Western civilization. Why does it happen? Curiously, the most popular explanation for the French Revolution at the time comes from a number of theorists who argue that this was caused by a specific branch of the Freemasons known as the Bavarian Illuminati. They infiltrated Masonic lodges, we'll get to masonry in a moment, and apparently undermined or agitated the French people to rebel against their monarch. It's a patently ridiculous theory, but it's interesting that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both read the works of Barrell and Robinson and agree that the Illuminati must have had something to do with it. When Thomas Jefferson is elected president in 1800, his political opponents, the Federalists, attack him as a so-called Jacobin. That is someone who wants to bring French radicalism and atheism to the United States. And a lot of conspiracy theories are spawned from that as well. So from the very early moments of a republic, conspiracy theories are, are pretty prominent. Theories about the Illuminati and the Jacobins kind of transit us to the 19th century. In the 19th century, the predominant theme of conspiracy theory is one of subversion, right? America has a democratic republic, but Americans worry that it might be undermined in some way, that it might be attacked and subverted in some way. And there are many enemies out there who are suspected of doing this. It might be enemies from the outside, Native Americans on the frontier, Catholics, Jews. It might be people in the lower rungs of society, immigrants, workers, enslaved persons. There's lots of conspiracy theories about slave rebellions. Or it might be enemies from above. The wealthy, as represented here in this cartoon of Andrew Jackson fighting off the Bank of the United States, which is portrayed as this mini-headed hydra. 
this kind of animal is very common way to represent conspiracy theories in the 19th and even the 20th century. It might be wealthy slave owners, or it might be Freemasons. But the reason I got interested in conspiracy theories is that I'm writing a book uh, about Freemasonry in the 19th century, specifically a controversy that arose out of that. So the first thing to understand is that Masonry, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, was a very popular, well-accepted organization of largely middle-class and elite men that originated in the early 18th century in England. It was a fraternity, essentially. It claimed to be of ancient origins. It claimed to trace its history back to the builders of Solomon's temple in the Bible and through various masonry guilds, that is stoneworker guilds uh, of uh, the early modern and medieval period. But really it was just sort of an organization of men who wanted to associate in private and network, essentially. Freemasonry was very popular in colonial and revolutionary America. In fact, the most famous American Freemason was George Washington. Uh, you can see him here depicted uh, in his traditional Masonic garb, uh, a Mason's apron, a trowel. Um, and Masonry, at least for Washington, um, was, he believed, a way of promoting virtuous behavior and habits among American men. He called it a fraternity of Republican virtues. Somewhere around the end of the 18th century, when Washington retires from the presidency, suspicions begin to arise that Freemasonry may be up to something else. Part of this, again, is the belief that the Illuminati, this secret branch within Freemasonry, had caused the French Revolution. A lot of uh, Americans uh, come to agree with this. Other suspicions center on the quasi-religious nature of Freemasonry which bills itself as a religion in which all men agree. Evangelicals, there's a growing number of them in the early 19th century, find that to be suspicious. Masons don't really help themselves because they do maintain a lot of their secret rituals and handshakes and things like that, and they tend to boast about how powerful and influential they are. So for example, in 1825, uh, Reverend William Brainerd uh, delivers a widely republished lecture about Freemasonry and how important it is in the early Republic. It's powerful, it comprises men of rank, wealth, influence. It's a power, it's of any importance, it comprises, uh, it comprises other classes of the community. It's basically everywhere, and it's powerful. And that boast, and boasts like this, tend to sow a lot of suspicion. That suspicion becomes rampant the following year in 1826. There's a man by the name of William Morgan. He lives not far from Syracuse University, uh, in Western New York, in Batavia. And after being kicked out of his local Masonic fraternity, threatens to publish the secrets of the Masons, their secret rituals, their secret teachings, things like that. Shortly after threatening this, he's kidnapped by a group of Masons and he's never seen again, presumably murdered. The citizens of Western New York are, as you might imagine, outraged by, by this. Fraternities shouldn't have the license to just go out and kill people. 
They demand that Morgan's disappearance be investigated and the various conspirators that they discover are tried. They're brought before courts and most of them are exonerated in part because local sheriffs have stacked the juries with Freemasons. And witnesses who could have attested to what happened to Morgan tend to just disappear. There are rumors that the governor of New York, a man by the name of DeWitt Clinton, who is also the leading Mason in New York, may have interfered with this. And this leads to a lot of conspiracy theories and suspicions that Andy Masons may be controlling the government, not only in New York, but the United States. Now, of course, Freemasons fight back and argue that Morgan was dishonest, a cheat, a liar. Some even argue that William Morgan didn't even exist. So there are arguments over even what he appeared like. Here are two images uh, that uh, the one you see, the, the more well-kept fellow, uh, is what Anti Mason said Morgan looked like. Uh, the other one, who kind of looks like a hobo, is what Freemasons said that Morgan looked like. So there's a, a lot of conspiracy theories and disinformation that are floating about. And there's just a lot of information generally. Within a few years, one third of the newspapers in the United States are anti-Masonic newspapers. Trials involving the abduction and murder of Morgan are widely reprinted. And there's all kinds of other printed ephemera, almanacs, things like that, uh, that uh, depict the crimes against Morgan and the dangers of Freemasonry. This has a wide impact on society, not only in Western New York, but throughout much of the Northeast. Churches, for example, expel Freemasons from their pews. Other Freemasons leave their lodges. They become seceding Masons and critics of Freemasonry, arguing that Freemasonry is in fact a great danger to the Republic and was likely guilty in the murder of Morgan. Soon, within a couple of years, Freemasonry, anti-Masonry, I'm sorry, becomes a political party. And in this instance, it's kind of exploited by people who may not have the most principles. For example, at one point in 1827, they fish a body out of Lake Ontario that they think is William Morgan, one of the leaders of the anti-Masons, a man by the name of Thurlow Weed, uh, insists that it is, and actually alters the corpse of this body to try and prove that this is Morgan. Uh, when he's confronted about this, uh, Weed says that this is good enough Morgan until the next election, right? So there are lots of political tricks going on here. And many of the anti-Masons, become Whigs, that is, they move into the Whig party. That tells us something important about 19th century politics. Right? When we start in the 19th century, around 1800, political parties tend to be viewed as conspiracies against the Republic, right? That is, there's no notion of legitimate opposition. Parties soon legitimate themselves by claiming to fight against conspiracies that are trying to overthrow the Republic. So if you are a Jacksonian Democrat, you say to voters, vote for me because I'm going to stop a conspiracy of the money power or of the British or the abolitionists or so on from subverting our republic. If you're a member of the Whig or Republican party, you say vote for me because I'm going to put a stop to this conspiracy that is enacted by slave, the slave power or the Pope or immigrants or anarchists or even Mormons to subvert the government or the morals of the republic. 
So parties in the 19th century present themselves then, or learn to, as mechanisms for preventing conspiracies. Continues on into the 20th century, but in the latter half of the 20th century, conspiracy theories take a real turn into something different. They focus less on politics and more on things outside of politics. Politics in post-1945 conspiracy theories become less important. They are dismissed as a hoax that distracts us from what's really going on, right? It sort of begins with the Cold War, which looks like a traditional American conspiracy theory. After all, there are communists, there are Soviets, they're trying to subvert the Republic, and there are all kinds of other moral panics that Americans augur in the 1950s, whether it's comic books, as, as you see here by the book Seduction of the Innocent, whether it's rock and roll, uh, here's a preacher uh, complaining about Ev Elvis Presley, or whether it's communists themselves. Certainly, an aggressive Soviet communism is a danger to the United States, but Americans in particular, American popular culture, tend to over-exaggerate it. So, for example, you have the Scott Tissue Company saying to employers uh, that if they don't really have good wash towels in their bathrooms, it might lead to communism. There's communism going on, according to Hollywood, right, on college campuses. But even that's not enough. People believe that actually Hollywood is full of communists. So the notion that there's these enemies within and they're really controlling what's going on really takes root. It's also true that the nature of the United States government changes considerably after 1945. We build what you might call the national security state. We devote considerable resources to agencies like the CIA, the National Security Agency, and others that are really not accountable necessarily to the American people. We don't really know what they're doing. And that breeds a lot of suspicion towards the federal government. In fact, in the 1970s, a number of whistleblowers and leakers reveal programs that are hatched by the FBI or the CIA uh, to basically engage in counter subversion, to identify enemies of America, to infiltrate so-called radical groups. For example, there's COINTELPRO, which begins as an FBI program devoted to rooting out anti-communists in American society. But once the civil rights movement begins to shift into gear, it focuses on civil rights activists and engages in uh, a lot of hoaxes. For example, it circulates a comic book that you can see here on, on, on your right uh, that it claims that the Black Panthers circulated that encourages violence against the police. Now, obviously this is nothing that the Black Panthers uh, did. It's a basically red flag operation that this that the FBI runs. Even more shocking, the Church Committee reveals that uh, the CIA is experimenting with all kinds of mind control things, right? That they're trying to develop chemicals uh, that will do all kinds of things. Uh, they experiment a lot with LSD, um, as well as you know substances which produce physical disablement cause blisters. Uh, at one point, they try to come up with some chemical that will cause Fidel Castro, the leader of Cuba, uh, to lose his beard. Now, obviously, this is pretty ridiculous stuff. But when it comes out, it's discussed in the newspapers, and then when Watergate 
1974 comes about, it really does diminish the trust that Americans have in their government or just the general trust that they have. So the chart here I'm showing you, if you asked people the question of most people can be trusted, in 1970, about 60% of Americans say that. By the time we get to 2015, only about 22% of people say that. So there's declining trust in the government, growing suspicion towards the government, and declining trust just generally among people. The reasons for that are really too much to explain here, but some of it has to do with technology. Bear in mind that from 1945 on, the rate of technological progress and innovation is just astounding, right? Whether it feels like aviation and space exploration, in communications or telecommunications, medical technologies and procedures, chemistry and pharmacology. For example, most of the drugs, 90% of the drugs prescribed by 1980 have been developed within the last 20 years. Now, some of this is exciting, but it's also worrying. It's hard to understand. Uh, so for example, here's a magazine uh, from 1957, Popular Mechanics, uh, which promises that we'll have flying cars by 1967. Didn't pan out that way. But um, it's written so you can understand it. It's hard to understand or relate to this rapid rate of technological change. And it leads to concerns about security, about people's privacy, about people's autonomy. For example, aviation is not really a common technology that Americans experience or understand until after 1945 or even well after that. But as soon as Americans become aware of aviation, they begin to see suspicious things in the sky. This occasionally happened before 1945. For example, in the 1890s, uh, there's some people who see curious airships in the air. They're probably Zeppelins. But it's not assumed that these are aliens. It's not assumed that the government is covering something up. But after 1945, increasingly, that becomes the case. So for example, in 1947, a pilot by the name of Kenneth Arnold is flying around Mount Rainier in Washington and purports to see a flying saucer, and this is the first time that term is actually used, traveling at a speed of around 12 to 1700 miles per hour. Stories picked up in the newspapers, people read it. And then just a month later, the Roswell Army Airfield in New Mexico reports that a flying saucer had crashed. That report gets in the newspapers. The Air Army Air Force quickly denies it. Nonetheless, that leads to the newly established U.S. Air Force in 1947 to begin to investigate these phenomena. They start with a project by the name of Project Sign. Allegedly, it shows that there are, in fact, aliens. And so they get rid of that project. Then they go to something called Project Grudge. I'm not sure why they call it that. Project Grudge is replaced by Project Blue Book, which then becomes the Condon Report in 1969, which asserts that there's no scientific value to studying unidentified flying objects. People suspect a cover-up. There are private groups that are investigating UFOs, such as the National Investigative Committee on Aerial Phenomena, uh, but the Condon Report kind of takes the wind out of their sails. The CIA worries that conspiracy theories about UFOs might in fact 
develop a harmful distrust of duly constituted authority, which turns out to be pretty prophetic. Because in the 60s and 70s, there's a growing interest in UFOs. Many of the people peddling these things are con artists. Uh, for example, there's a guy by the name of George Adam Maskey who publishes uh, a number of best-selling books about the flying saucers. Uh, it's revealed uh, that in fact, the flying saucers that he claims to have photographed are actually just a popular General Electric's lamp, right? More sincere believers uh, like the married couple Betty and Barney Hill that you see here claim to have been abducted by an alien spacecraft. Uh, they undergo hypnosis to try and restore these memories. There's great interest in their story. And interestingly enough, there's a growing number of people who claim to have been abducted by UFOs. And the story is often kind of the same. It's about medical experimentation or some sort of ritual abuse, which is a very common theme in conspiracy theories. And then there are so-called paleo contact theories. Lacking any evidence of UFOs today, people begin to argue that many of the archeological objects that we see on earth were actually produced by aliens. So the Egyptian pyramids, according to Eric von Deineken, were built by space aliens. They're crop circles, things like that. These kinds of theories then take on a new life in the 1980s when stories about Roswell are unearthed again and forged into a theory that aliens landed there, took part in a government project called MJ-12 in which the government exchanged alien technology for human bodies. You still with me on this? The most popular theorist of this uh, was a talk show host by the name of Bill Cooper, who wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse in 1991, which fused ufology with a bit of Christian apocalypticism and far-right conspiracy. So ufology took kind of a turn to the right in the 1990s and led to these kinds of global conspiracy theories in which every possible institution or event that you could imagine could all be tied together, right? And that's so-called conspiracism, right? Which is different from conspiracy theory in the sense that it's not really about finding evidence of particular events, but just alleging that a large conglomeration of powerful people are running things. There's no interest really in consistency or evidence, in part because these conspiracies are circulated on the internet, where reputation, or repetition, I'm sorry, matters more than evidence. In fact, the current kind of conspiracist environment that we live in might be best described as one of participatory disinformation, right? That people find and create and share conspiracy theories. And that in the real world, those can have pretty dangerous effects. So for example, conspiracy theories about the last presidential election. It began with a number of political elites asserting that the election had been stolen, but then it took on a life of its own. People developed and shared different claims about that. They eventually organized rallies and protests, and that led, of course, to January 6. This is a very different kind of world of conspiracy theories where they're no longer something that really contributes to political parties, they're actually something that's kind of outside of it. Anyway, I'm gonna stop there. I've gone on a little bit too long and I wanna open things up if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you we were talking about earlier about the gunpowder plot. Um, uh -huh. Was there any like more information you had about that, um, about the circumstances behind the gunpowder plot? 
Yeah, well, you know, so keep in mind that, that, that at the time, early 17th century England, um, there are a lot of Catholics in England and they feel that they are being oppressed, right? Um, by the Stuarts who have recently taken power. Um, so, you know, it's, it's alleged that Guy Fox uh, is going to try to blow up parliament. Uh, he's tried, he's executed. The evidence of that is, is not all that clear, but it's certainly true that, um, you know, there was a lot of tension between Catholics and Protestants. For example, up until recently, in fact, in some places in England, I think there's still Guy Fox's days, right? Which is now known as, po which becomes known as Pope's Day, in which the Pope is burned in effigy, things like that. So there's a lot of anti-Catholicism that's kind of driving this, if that, if that helps. Thank okay. you so much for answering my question. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, so you're writing a book on the Freemasons, right? Well, yeah, on the on the on the Morgan kidnapping specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so m my exposure to the Freemasons thus far has been limited to National Treasure, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I guess I just my questions. I know there's I'm sure there's many inaccuracies in the film about the Freemasons, but mm -hmm. what is something that perhaps they got right about the Freemasons in the film? Well, I will say that. Um, I would very much like to discover a large cache of treasure, right? Uh, that, that would be a boon for my career, but that doesn't exist, right? I mean, it is true that Freemasonry and its symbols were very common among the founders, right? Um, so, you know, Washington was a Freemason, a uh, number of other of the founders were Freemasons, but it's also just like something that's kind of widespread throughout the culture, right? Um, so, uh, for example, you know, the, the eye of Providence, that, that pyramid with the eye on the top, that's a Masonic symbol, right? Um, those sorts of things. Um, and I think if I can remember the movie well enough, it does kind of touch on that. Uh, the rest of it, uh, yeah, there's, there's no secret treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that, not 100% sure of that, um, but um, yeah, so that's that's the best I could do with that. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, thanks for coming out. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, and um, if you'd like to contact uh, me, uh, you know, uh, I can be reached uh, at, um, I'll just type my email address in here. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in a history major, I can certainly talk to you about that as well.